Hello and welcome back to another episode of Dark Souls Dissected. Have you ever wondered what's up with some of these dead ends? I know that for a lot of players like myself, there's something alluring about blocked off paths and inaccessible areas. But there are tools for going out of bounds or just taking a look with free cam. So the mystique of these might have waned a bit, as everyone collectively understood that there's nothing really back there. But that's not the end of their story. In a previous episode, we uncovered some out of bounds content that had implications for how Dark Souls looked earlier in development. This time, join me as we explore the prototype maps of Dark Souls 1 to learn more about how its design evolved. Let's start with this early map for Blighttown. Unlike my video on the gutter for Dark Souls 2, this isn't some really cool map that I wish we got instead. It's far too unfinished. But what makes it fascinating is how it completely recontextualizes a few of its set pieces. I know a lot of people wonder what's up with this hallway by Quaylag's sister. If you defeat Kirk in all three places he invades, his corpse and armor set will be found back here so it doesn't go completely to waste. But the prototype map reveals that this hallway was made with the intention of being an open passage, and at some point it was being considered as a path back to Firelink Shrine. How would this have worked? Well, I don't think the developers really knew either, and it's going to become apparent very quickly how we wound up with something different. This early Blighttown map includes an early Firelink Shrine attached to it. So let's start there and make our way down to the New Lunder Ruins elevator. Down here, we find that the same elevator room hasn't been fully completed yet. Instead, it just runs immediately into this elevator shaft. But as we jump down, we're going to find that this doesn't lead to New Lunder Ruins at all. Instead, it lands us at the end of a long, completely flat and barren walkway, and it just leads straight to Quaylag's domain. Of course, the map was never going to have a really long and simple path like this, so this was obviously just a rough placeholder. Now, you might have noticed a few other paths out here, which takes us to our next point of interest. Higher up in Blighttown, we have this area where you can pick up the Firekeeper Soul. If you ever thought this patch of wall and gate over here were a little suspicious, it turns out that was completely justified. There used to be a lever here. I find it interesting that, even with the lever removed, that they still bothered to keep something here at all. But I suppose that's what happens when modifying placeholder content. With this already designed the way it was, might as well just remove the lever itself instead of its entire alcove. Behind it, we have not one, but two paths taking us back to Quaylag's domain and Firelink Shrine. You can see that they were debating between a path that slopes downwards, versus one that goes straight down before heading over. To make better sense of this from another angle, here's the elevator shaft from Firelink Shrine, here's the sloping path from where we just were, and here's the alternate elevator shaft from where we just were. We're left with a curious set piece that's without explanation in the final game. If someone like Bluepoint ever gets to do a Dark Souls remake, I think putting a broken lever here, rather than just having a perfectly flat and empty wall, would be a great way to merge the two designs. While all this basic placeholder geography might not be all that exciting on its own, I find this early map fascinating because it reveals an important stage of From Software's world design. They knew they wanted a bunch of interconnecting paths, but before they knew exactly what that was going to look like, they started with some really basic placeholders to get a general feeling for how different levels would be placed with regards to each other, while worrying about the details of how they actually connect later. Which is really the only design pathway I can imagine making any sense, but it's cool to actually see it. When we wonder what kind of work went into making Dark Souls 1 as interconnected as it is, this is what an early version of that looks like. There's also another path down here, which takes us to another location. The prototype map has a path running past where the bonfire and large vertical shaft wound up, connecting to the other paths. This one I find interesting because it's the least obvious remnant of a cut path here, but it does put it under a bit of a different light for me. It was always an odd little detour from the bonfire, taking you to a big open space with a chest containing an upgrade material. There's no enemies here, and it makes me wonder what else the space might have been considered for. 
Maybe the idea was always just to have an item chest, but I don't know. Seeing the unused path that used to run through here helps raise the idea that this space might have been repurposed as it was being designed. But that's not to say that the space wasn't well utilized. It might be a little empty for such a unique set piece, but what the space lacks in terms of utility is more than made up for with some interesting environmental cohesion. Something I've talked about in a previous video is that even though we can't find any kind of circular pit rendered from the Gaping Dragon's room, there is some partial overlap between the pit that the Gaping Dragon crawls out from and the vertical Blighttown shaft. The chest down here containing the Dragon Scale likely isn't a coincidence. It seems to recognize this area's placement as being below the boss room. The implication is that maybe the Gaping Dragon crawled out from down here in Blighttown. If this feels like a stretch, the relationship between the Depths and Blighttown seems to have been something the devs were thinking about. We have the parasitic wall hugger up over here. Why is it latched onto this particular wall? Well, it's placing itself at the end of a ramp here, implying that it's feeding on runoff from the depths. And if we have a sewer system that's flowing into Blighttown, that explains things like the stagnating poison water at the bottom, and perhaps even why the barbarians are carrying dung pies. Whether there was ever a specific intention to imply that this is where the gaping dragon came from, it's a reasonable, headcanon-y conclusion in light of all of this. This is all to say that a space like this allows us to speculate on the world layout and spatial relationship of different areas. When we contrast this to these placeholder paths, I think it speaks to how well they handled reworking the space concept. Whoever's job it was to make this make sense completely nailed it. Maybe it feels rough to some viewers that we can find vestigial dead ends relating to the prototype map. And whenever cut content is brought up, there's usually some people wanting to see the game's quote-unquote original intention. But just to be crystal clear, what we see here pales in comparison to what we actually got. We don't need a path connecting this to Firelink. This former path was effectively replaced by the back entrance to Blighttown, while this path here either turned into or was replaced by a massive detour running all the way down through the depths and upper Blighttown. These prototype paths are completely obviated by the game's final design and we can see how this brainstorming stage was improved upon. What else can we see in this proto Blight Town? Looking down from Firelink Shrine, we can see the area with the Firekeeper soul over here. Comparing this to the actual map data in the final game, we can see that its relationship remains intact. They didn't have to wind up moving it somewhere else. We can also see the massive columns of Blight Town placed similarly below which means the relationship between Firelink and Blighttown was already starting to get locked down at this point in development. Even though so much of Blighttown is missing, and even though the placeholder paths were completely discarded, this still became the framework for them to flush things out. For example, over here we can see that none of Upper Blighttown has been completed yet, but the alcove that contains it was already in the works. It just needed to be extended further out. Same goes for the area containing the Firekeeper Soul. The exterior was already created, just not any of the surrounding scaffolding yet. Ignoring all the weird unused paths, it's really just an unfinished version of Blighttown as we already know it. Here is one last thing to look at before we depart from Blighttown. Down by the tunnel with the bonfire, we can see that basically none of the swamp had been completed yet, but having a big flat plain down here indicates that they probably knew it was coming. What I find interesting is that even though we had all these bizarre interconnecting paths leading into Quelag's domain, the front and final entrance was already very solid at this point. This entrance mound here wasn't implemented yet, but the cave itself was. Quelag's boss room was already here, and even though it's missing some detailing we find in the final game, the basic shape and exact placement of everything is exact to the final game, even stuff like the contours of the ceiling. The area with the second bell of awakening is also the same. We don't see a representation of the lever itself, but the hole in the floor, the placement of the spiraling staircase, the entrance to the demon ruins, the location of the illusory wall, and a circular impression on the floor marking the location of the elevator. All of that lines up perfectly. Now, having things line up too perfectly isn't all that exciting, because then we're just looking at the map we already know. I'm sure you'd like to see weird stuff that's different, and I've got just the thing for you, an even earlier prototype map.
Here we're in a very rough version of the cave leading into Quelag's boss room. Here the room is a lot more basic, though the overall shape of the room and the placement of the exit are still recognizable. I like this cast of weirdos over here, but they were clearly just testing some things and we can't really assume anything about different boss fight intentions. The only thing we really know about different boss fight intentions is that Quelag had some cut dialogue. How this would have fit into the game exactly is anyone's guess. Welcome, bringer of meat. The children of chaos are hungry. As we make our way to the second Bell of Awakening, we find a much rougher version that starts to feel more alien. There's some rubble blocking this path, something not in the final game at all. The open segments of wall in front of us were already shaping up, but it's much simpler and different execution here, one that they clearly had to scrap and redo from scratch. And while the descending spiral staircase is already here, its placement is slightly different, a bit further off to the right. Now, even in this very early map, they already had the idea to have an opening on your right where you can see into the demon ruins. We don't see the window spaces yet that wound up restricting our view a little bit more, instead we just have an open railing that then winds up back inside an enclosure. And down here, we have whatever the hell this thing is. You don't often see this kind of detail in the prototype maps, so I think what we're looking at is an early understanding that something important was supposed to be here. Did they already know we were going to be ringing two bells at this point in development? I'm not sure. It's entirely possible, and maybe this is just like a really really weird placeholder for the bell's lever. But I don't think you'd model something that detailed for that. So my best guess is that they simply knew they wanted some important progression event found in this location, but what you were going to interact with probably wasn't figured out yet. It could have been some weird object to smash, or a magical mechanism to turn off, who knows. What makes this even weirder is how the Darkroot Garden has some really strange unused map pieces that include these, so this just adds to the mystery for whatever the heck these were. Now you might be thinking, wasn't the bell's lever up above? Maybe this is just the elevator with the strange mechanism, because this is where the elevator should be, but I know it's at least not that, and we'll see why in a second. Behind us and to our right is the area with Quelag's sister. This time the opening is much wider than the one we got with the illusory wall. It's just a really simple room shape that's not at all recognizable at this stage. And here we have our entrance to the demon ruins, but we're going to be greeted by something very different. So at this point in development, they did have an elevator in mind, but it was outside the area with the bell, and the elevator was surrounded by this interesting set piece, something we didn't get in the final game. The elevator was designed to go down from here as well, but let's continue ahead first. We don't have the descending path to the lava, instead it's just a sheer cliff. Though as different as this is, some basic concepts are starting to take shape. We do have this route to our right, a bridge that takes us to a path with a wall on our right and a cliff on the left. This is clearly what turned into the entrance to Ceaseless Discharge. The layout is a bit different in that you normally have to drop down to that bridge. While on the prototype map, it's closer and more level to Quelag's domain. But the map dead ends shortly after this bridge and walkway, so the Ceaseless Discharge Arena is nowhere to be seen yet. Speaking of things not seen, it's not surprising that none of the Out of Bounds distant areas have been constructed yet, but I do think we can start to see the idea taking hold. The cliff wall below has various nooks in it. In the final game, these nooks are above us instead of below, but this is surely an early iteration of the same basic idea. Though we can never actually visit any of these spaces in the final game, in this prototype map I do think some of these were meant to be part of the playable game space. There is no way down from here, we're completely surrounded by cliffs, but this highest nook has stairs surrounding it, so the intention of a walkway that takes us by at least one of them seems likely. A walkway that would hug the cliff wall, which, while executed very differently in the final game, is something that still sort of happens. It's reasonable to assume that we would head down this way, because this does take us back to some terrain we can explore. But the platform with all the capper demons is nowhere to be seen. Instead, there's a descending ramp of sorts that we have to drop off of. To our left, there's a room with a tall ceiling and a staircase that takes us up to a platform. This isn't relatable to anything we find over here in the demon ruins, Unless maybe we think of it as a smaller version of the Capper platform, but it's moved off of the main path.
Continuing ahead, we have a short staircase next to a narrow bridge. The staircase allows us to walk along a ledge for a bit, but there's not a clear pathway or purpose that extends from it. So down the bridge we go. And it's going to become apparent how quickly off the rails this is going. There isn't much to recognize from here. We're now looking at a very different demon ruins. One where traveling into the distant nooks we see in the final game was the initial concept. For example, we see this area off to our left as we descend the bridge. But instead of just being scenery, we do get to go inside. Continuing on, we have this set piece that reminds me a lot of the Crystal Cave. You have these cylindrical structures to descend. This all leads to another descending path. This one has some columns to our right, which reminds me again of this spot in the final level, even though we've already traveled much further away from where Ceaseless was. To our left, there's a big open space with some curious architecture. There's not much to go on, but seeing a room like this will always have me guessing it was probably for a boss. Moving forward, we have a path that ramps back up for a bit, before splitting into two different directions. One taking us further up, and another heading back down. But the upwards path quickly dead ends. The downwards path takes us to a big open plain. Would this have been the lava field? Something akin to the area by Ceaseless or the Centipede Demon? Or, knowing that Isolith was going to be a swamp earlier in development, perhaps this would be another poison swamp. It's anyone's guess. Walking straight ahead puts us near to, albeit much further below, the entrance to Ceaseless. So it feels like some gross environment was probably down here. That wraps up everything there is to see in this prototype Demon Ruins, aside from one last thing. The elevator. Where was that going to go? The elevator shaft itself just dead ends, so it's incomplete in this version. But clipping through the bottom and continuing a little further straight down puts us back over here, right by the room I was speculating to be a boss room. In the final game, the elevator is a shortcut you'll unlock after defeating a boss, so this seems like a close match to how it was implemented in the final game, despite the rest of the level and the rooms therein being very different. What else is there to look at? Well, let's head over to New Londo Ruins. Or as I like to call it, the Old Londo Ruins. When we first load the map, we're greeted right away by the series' true protagonist, Mr. John Dark Souls himself but we'll return here later. To better orient ourselves, let's start in Firelink. Yes, this prototype map also has another copy of Firelink Shrine. There is less of it here than what we find in Blighttown's prototype map, but I don't think it was actually any less completed at this point. It's more likely that they just copied the only segment that mattered to them when trying to decide on its relationship to New London Ruins. What will we find at the bottom of the elevator shaft this time? Hey, it's actually like the final game here or it's close enough. So just make a mental note for now that all the former paths to Quelag's domain no longer fit into this design. There are some small differences, like how when you step out of the elevator, there should be a counterclockwise path to this doorway, while the prototype has a clockwise path instead. And we see these wide, blocky platforms surrounding it, but those were probably just placeholders for these thinner walls that encircle the path. I do find these characters interesting. Were they here to help the map designers have a sense of scale to work with? I'm not totally sure. If you have any guesses or insight why these might be here, I'd love to know. The Dark Souls 2 prototype maps had blocky characters in some places as well, so it's not just a one-off. I'm sure it serves a purpose. Heading down the stairs, we find that the space for Rickard of Vinheim's cell isn't carved out here yet. And down here we have the water. Of course it doesn't look like water, but clipping the camera below helps us see that they already intended for this to be the waterline. 
Unsurprisingly, the underwater and out-of-bounds buildings haven't been fully placed yet, but we can see some blocky areas in the distance, and those were likely the start of that. And off to the side and below the map, we can find a bunch more. This doesn't indicate that the water was ever meant to be a lot deeper, they probably just wanted a clean workspace as they began work on them. And what else do we find down here? It's the Chaos Covenant area with the dead-ending hallway once again. What is it doing over here? Well, at this point, as I just showed a moment ago, they had the Firelink Elevator drop us off in New London Ruins, instead of onto the path leading to the Chaos Covenant. This means that, at this point, they were already reconsidering how things might lead to this area in Quelag's domain. But to see it pop up here again is interesting, because it suggests that they were still thinking about this set piece and its relationship to the other maps. To me, it really looks like they were still holding on to the hope that they would think of some other way to have other paths that led there. But with these paths now erased, it was even more of a question mark at this stage. We are seeing it on its way out, before it was scrapped entirely and just became the dead end that it is today. Back up the stairs and over to our left here is the path that leads to the Valley of the Drakes, but we'll take a look at that later. The walk along this path was a bit more cramped previously and a lot less defined. And over here, we find a very basic placeholder bridge. We don't have any of the stairs or connecting platforms. And while the final design still curves to the right, that's across two straight bridges, instead of having one giant curve. And instead of leading to a landing with a few ghosts on it, our entrance into the first ghost house is a bit different. Instead of having these ghost platforms on the way, we have this tall and narrow staircase that brings us up to the top. It's at the top of the stairs that we have an open area off to the right. Evidence that they already wanted some wider platforms in this general area, but they wound up doing it quite a bit differently. As we first make our way in, the ghost house isn't really recognizable right away, but it's not all that different. There is something of an inverted perspective here, as in the final design, you have two paths on your left. One that leads to a shortcut you can open later, and then the second path is the path forward. Here, we find a sort of mirror image of the same concept. The two paths are instead on the right. Once again, the first path is inaccessible, at least for now, and then it's the second path we need to take. The interior is different as well, even though the overall size and shape is pretty similar. Off to our right, we have a broken walkway and some stairs that don't connect all the way to the ground level. Just like the elevator in the final game, I think this was already shaping up to be a shortcut. How it would have worked exactly, I'm not totally sure, but I can picture something like raising a ladder here that would have connected this path. Then you could open up this doorway and we'd have a similar shortcut. And with the shortcut open, this broken part of the walkway becomes a drop-down path. But since that's not the first path forward, once again things are a bit mirrored in a way. Instead of traveling in a counterclockwise path through the room, we're going the other way around. This means that having the far end of the room be inaccessible before draining the water wasn't a thing yet where they later added stairs from the ground level that got you up there. Back outside, we do find a set piece that's very similar to the final game. They changed it a little bit, but it's still recognizable. This area in the prototype has this walkway imply more of a square shape, while in the final version, it was stretched out into a much longer rectangle. We see the roof above the walkway in both versions, but the final version doesn't continue on over the collapsed part of the walkway. And the entrance to this area is a short descending staircase from the first building, but this was later changed to have the stairs go up instead. We normally have this shortcut ladder here. In the prototype, it's not entirely clear if they were already planning on it, but it seems very likely. I didn't previously show the actual walk towards the first building, but here's what the first half of that looks like. From here, instead of continuing further, we can drop down and walk to right underneath this platform. Considering how the final game also has you do this little drop to get to the ladder, it really seems like a different take on the same basic idea. Which is really the entire theme of this New London Ruins comparison. The whole thing feels like a fever dream variant that's mostly familiar. If you're deeply familiar with Dark Souls 1, you absolutely wouldn't get lost here. You can still navigate this prototype map with ease, but the moment you stop to look at any single set piece, it's impossible to not find something different. 
The Blighttown prototype map has a lot more spaces where it feels like they locked it in early and just had to flush out what was there. Which was probably easier to do there, since you can add scaffolding however you want into this existing space. While this New London Ruins map, despite feeling really tight conceptually, in terms of the actual level geometry, it's hard to find any spots that are exactly the same. It all had to be reworked. Inside the second ghost house, things are a bit different. We have more of these platforms, these sorts of ceilings above the walkway, and a dead-ending path to our left. It was basically just going to be another one of these sections, but they removed it completely. This makes sense to me, as they probably wanted the player to have a clear line of sight to the lever and the floodgate. This extra stuff in the prototype obstructs that view. The path outside the second ghost house is interesting, because we see some of the same ideas already here. We have a broken walkway, where in the final game you can safely jump it, while here in the prototype you definitely wouldn't be able to make that. However, in both the prototype and the final game, going around the broken walkway is as easy as doing this. But aside from that one path being recognizable, the rest of the interior is different. We don't have anything like the hallways or rooms in the middle. We don't have a ladder leading up to the roof, or even a roof that you could stand on at all. We also don't have an opening for the curse bite ring. Instead, there are some incomplete staircases heading down. Maybe it's something like a drop down path that becomes viable after draining the water. Being able to safely descend from the second building is something still in the game. You don't have to take one of the elevators down. But it's interesting to see that possibly change from happening inside the second ghost house to outside of it instead. Now, if you've ever wondered if being able to drop down here was an oversight, like perhaps from software wanted you to use the elevators and they just didn't account for everything with draining the water, I can assure you that this was all part of the plan. There's a hidden developer message that becomes visible with Seek Guidance, telling you to jump down. When we see how the prototype map had a drop down path inside the building, it feels like the idea evolved so that going inside either building on the way to the boss wasn't necessary. Once you have the ladder shortcut opened up, it's easy to run by a small handful of ghosts and not have to fight any. I think From Software was accounting for the lack of a bonfire in New Londa Ruins and wanted to have an easy boss run for observant players. I know not everyone is a fan of not having a checkpoint right before a boss, but there is some very good level design here that takes that into consideration at least. As we exit this building, the game normally has this short detour where we can step into a tower to get a green titanite shard. This tower is also the potential spawn location of a good vagrant, but ultimately the path forward is turning around and going up some stairs. In the prototype, the small tower isn't a detour, instead the path forward takes us through. Things feel a little incomplete back here. Eventually we find a lever. While we can't be 100% sure if it's the floodgate lever or an elevator lever, the lever is centered above the floodgate here, so it's probably that. There's an unused cutscene of the RTSR's tower in the Valley of Drakes having a functioning floodgate lever as well, but I always figured that was an alternate second option that got scrapped. Something like New Lander Ruins having a back entrance comparable to Blighttown's back entrance. I don't think the implication of this unused cutscene was that this was ever supposed to be the only place where we could open the floodgates earlier in development, and the prototype map seems to agree with my hunch. Finding another lever inside suggests that this was always going to be the primary method. Down here, things are a lot less complete. We don't have any of this stuff yet. Inside the ground level of the first ghost house, we have these sorts of nooks underneath the stairs on both sides of the room. These appear to have been reconceptualized into these wooden stables. The biggest difference is that the prototype had this big opening over on the side of the room, with an area to explore outside. In this outside area, we find another curved walkway. It's actually a continuation of the first walkway, which was blocked off by the staircase. 
but here it continues on the other side, off to some unknown destination. The final game doesn't have anything like this. Not only is there a solid wall here, but there's no architecture rendered outside and no collision that you'd be able to walk on. However, if we don't go fully behind the building, we do have this out of bounds area that's off to the side. And there is a staircase and walkway that runs along the wall, which might be what became of that curved path. This next area is a bit simplified. It still has that sort of pool area with the columns around it, but it's missing the area with the illusory wall, and there isn't even a path into the ground level of the second ghost house. I think not being able to enter the second building means it was meant to be more of a drop-down path sort of thing. The well isn't here yet, but instead we have the base of the ruins of a tower, which isn't in the final game. And beyond that, although we're approaching from a different angle, we find the entrance to the Four Kings, or at least where that winds up. This time it's not inside a tower, and we just have this curious placeholder marking on the ground. Perhaps this ruined tower over by where the well was got moved and merged with the Four Kings entrance. That tower isn't in great condition either, after all. Okay, but let's head all the way back to where we first loaded into the level. Where are we? We're on some weird platform in Upper Blighttown that appears to be right above the area with the Firekeeper's soul. It's a bit of a curious start, as we didn't see this platform in the other Blighttown map. So at this point, they've started thinking about the back entrance to Blighttown as another path into the area, and we get to see an early version of that. As we walk along it, you might be expecting us to pop out in the Valley of Drakes, but surprise, it's straight into New Londa Ruins. But we're still entering from where the entrance to the valley should be. Before we move on, I think it's important to stop and think about what this means for the Valley of Drakes exactly. It was always kind of obvious that it was just a connecting path between three different levels, and not really its own proper area. But seeing it not exist yet while they're already planning on these interconnected layouts, this strongly indicates, to me at least, that the Valley of Drakes was their final bit of wiggle room in their world design. I believe it's the linchpin that makes the whole concept work. There are some routes that loop back around in impressively tight and considerate ways, but short of that, when you have some areas that you're not entirely sure how to connect, the easiest solution is to just put in a cave that bends and twists any direction you need it to, and maybe throw in an elevator if you have a map that's a lot higher or lower. If there's one area of the game where we can look at it and say that it probably had the least intent, or the weakest vision in terms of being its own proper area, of course this is it. It's filler that makes other pieces fit together. But if it sounds like I'm being harsh on the Valley of Drakes, I actually still really, really appreciate what they did here. In planning an interconnected world, you can't expect everything to be on the level of the Undead Parish elevator. That whole circular path from Firelink back to Firelink is so meticulously crafted, it's simply unreasonable to expect that level of design throughout the entire game. You're almost certainly going to need your generic cave at some point to connect the dots, and that's okay. And, to this area's credit, they certainly weren't as lazy about it as they could have been. It has an open sky, after all. This kind of splits the difference with the whole generic cave idea. Sure, you get to have these tall mountainous walls that conveniently divide your different levels, but they didn't completely take the easy way out and put it underground. This means they had to account for distant views from several different vantage points. You can see the Valley of Drakes from Firelink Shrine. You can see it from the Undead Burg. You can see it from the Darkroot Basin and you can see the Hellkite Bridge from down in the valley. In the end, it doesn't feel wedged in, nor does it feel like an afterthought, even with the overall lack of things to do here. This is because of how much effort went into making it feel like a landmark that's supposed to be here. Alright, so what else can we dig up from the prototype maps? The Blighttown map had the most complete version of Firelink Shrine, so let's head back there. The underside of the Hellkite Bridge has this extra doorway on the reverse side. It's not a surprise, I talked about this in my Out of Bounds exploration video, but it is neat seeing it here again. For those who are unfamiliar, there was originally going to be an opening here that would let you explore this other part of the bridge. While it was removed, several remnants of it remain. Depending on where you're standing, from the outside it's still seen as either open or with a sort of doorway frame.
And from the inside, if you look carefully, you can see how the dark segment running along the floor abruptly stops, framing the spot where the opening used to be. A bigger point of discussion for my Out of Bounds video is how this structure here, which looks suspiciously like a real kiln, used to be off to the right of this building over here. And there's an unused cutscene where Andre was supposed to push this statue away, granting you access inside. What I didn't previously show was how this was also accounted for in the prototype map, as a path leading downwards, which would have led to the kiln. I like the idea that this is supposed to be a former kiln of some sort, that hides the entrance to some weird pocket dimension place where there's a giant fantasy kiln of sorts. And up top, we have an early version of the Undead Parish Church, but we can't really compare the whole thing because they only included a facade for the most part, but the interior of the bell tower is much the same, so there's nothing too special to see here. That wraps up everything I wanted to share about the prototype maps for today. I didn't exhaust every prototype map that exists, and I could perhaps share more of them in a future demonstration, but most of the rest are just simple test maps, clearly never meant to be part of the game. There's some silly stuff to see in some of them, but I did go through all the ones that help inform us about how the game's design evolved. Perhaps the most tantalizing remaining map is this one, where it does look like the early stages of an actual level, only it's completely unrecognizable. I can't tell if it's maybe supposed to be an early version of the Crystal Cave or Great Hollow, but no amount of exploring it will yield an answer because it really is its own thing. It could just be some random scrapped level entirely. Leave a comment below if you'd like to see a closer look at this stuff. But before we finish, I should mention that there are other things hiding in the game's files that can tell us even more about Dark Souls' development. Outside of the full prototype maps, we sometimes have unused, smaller chunks of level geometry, like that really strange set piece found among the Darkroot Garden files, which can reveal some pretty weird stuff. And dummied out objects, enemies, and even concept art are among other types of assets that can provide a more complete picture. So I'd like to end things here by recommending some recent videos by a couple friends of mine who were looking at exactly these sorts of things. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that Lost Isleth used to be a swamp earlier in development. If you had no idea what I was talking about, King Boar made a video that lays out all the evidence. It's a recent discovery. And while we're in the Undead Burg, we can see a building over by the Sunlight Altar from this distant view that disappears once we're actually there. This was originally meant to be the exterior of the building with the Butcher in the depths. Whether this is where the entrance to the Depths was going to be, or if that part of the Depths was originally just supposed to be part of the Undead Parish, we don't really know. But this video from Samuel Diamond proves that that's what this used to be. Links to their videos can be found in the video description. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and doing all the engagement things that help. They really make a difference. You can also support me directly on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash illusorywall. I don't have anything specific to announce just yet, but stay tuned because sometime not too long from now I'll be launching a second channel. I want a place to do more laid-back and unscripted content, whether that's modded Souls runs, or just Let's Plays, or streams of stuff that isn't even related to Dark Souls at all, I've been looking forward to making a space for that. I'll make a bigger mention of it in my community tab once it's ready. An extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. Basileus, Europa, Gary Marshall, Hugsized, Inciaratable, Kakaruma, Carl Germ, Kiko Bod, Chris, Ashwan Azari, Nate Hines, Quinn Parsons, Ronax, Majalis Duo, and Zelther. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for watching.